if that will help. <laughs> uh oh, we're recorded now. <laughs> okay, I just got a note that the me meeting's being recorded. Yeah, that's because Justin just hopped on. Oh, okay. Justin. I, I um, ah. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming early on a Saturday morning to learn about whales and our Whale Watch program. Uh, greatly appreciated, really heartening to see such a big turnout of uh, people who care about marine mammals and ocean conservation in general, and um, just super heartening to see how many people are here. I love it. Um, so uh, this morning, um, I'll just go over the agenda, what we're going to cover. Um, First, uh, our executive director, Justin Lindeberg, is, is going to introduce himself and welcome everybody and speak a little bit. Um, and then uh, my name's Andrew Scott. I'm the volunteer programs manager here at Stewards. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the California Parks uh, Volunteer and Parks program and just talk a little bit about Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods and what our goals and missions and aims are, and also talk a little bit about the importance of, of volunteering, um, which is uh, something that maybe doesn't get talked about enough, just how valuable and necessary volunteers are. Um, then we have uh, Hollis is going to speak about marine protected areas. Hollis is our um, uh, volunteer coordinator for a lot of the coast programs and is an incredible fountain of coastal knowledge. Um, so that will be great. And um, then we have our uh, whale watch coordinators, Norma, Rich and Colleen that are gonna give the whale presentation, uh, speak about whales, do some questions and answers about uh, the program. Uh, the logistics of the Whale Watch program, Colleen and Rich will talk about that also. Um, then Amelia Shaw, um, who uh, is the district volunteer coordinator, is going to go over the nuts and bolts of uh, how to get signed up as a volunteer and uh, how to report your hours as a volunteer, which is a really important thing because reporting your hours as a volunteer is uh, what gets you a district uh, uh, parks pass or a state parks pass depending on how many hours you have volunteered and um, I should stress that even if you're not interested in volunteering for the reward of a state parks pass or a district pass uh, logging your volunteer hours is a really really important thing because it allows us to um, as an organization make sure we're putting our resources in the right place and it also really helps um, for um, securing funding for programs in the future if we know how many people are participating in them. So um, that's a really important thing. And then uh, right at the end, we're gonna talk briefly about scheduling, um, how to schedule your time to participate in the program. And um, there'll be time for questions and answers. Please throw any questions you have in the chat and we'll answer them as best we can as we go along. And uh, that's about it from me for the moment. Justin, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit? About yeah. Sports? Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's training. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Stewards really uh, relies on volunteers to uh, get our message out um, and to complete our programming. So thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Um, I am new, relatively new with Stewards. I've been around a month and a half. Uh, some of you may know Michelle Luna, who is currently our Executive Director Emeritus and with us for just about another month um, as we complete our leadership transition. Um, for, for those of you that might be new to Stewards, we were founded in 1985 to support California State Park's Russian River District. Our mission is to promote education, preservation, and restoration of natural and cultural resources in Armstrong Redwoods, Austin Creek, and Sonoma Coast State Park. Um, we're a volunteer-led organization, so thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you become involved as a volunteer, potentially for Whale Watch. Um, we also have lots of other volunteer programs. I hope you might uh, be interested in checking out. We, there's also other ways to get involved this holiday season. Um, for example, we're running an 
auction online. You can find it on our website right now. Um, with us today, we have our partners at California State Parks, board members, um, volunteer coordinators, and really the people that make stewards tick. So thank them for joining and I'll hand it back to you, Andrew. Um, I wasn't going to mention it, but uh, Justin mentioned it. I, I really have to say that um, Whale Watch is great, but we have a billion other programs that you can get involved with too. And we're always in need of volunteers. So you can be a trail crew member. You can be a, a roving docent. You can be a tide pool docent. Um, you can do seal watch. We have uh, so many things to offer. So please um, take a look at our website, see what other volunteer opportunities are available or uh, contact me directly and I can um, help you find a program that would be a fit for you. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to talk uh, a moment about um, who stewards are, what we do, um, and, and really what the, the, the value of uh, volunteering is and why volunteers are really needed for this program and, and all other programs. And I made some notes for myself because I'm an incredibly forgetful person. Um, so uh, Stewards of the Coast of Redwoods, we're, we're a nonprofit organization that partners with the Russian River sector of state parks as a cooperating organization. Um, and in cooperation with state parks, we manage Armstrong Redwoods State Natural Reserve, uh, the Austin Creek State Recreation Area, which is currently closed uh, due to damage from the Warbridge fire, but we are working as rapidly as we can on reopening that. Um, and uh, of course, Sonoma Coast State Park. Um, our mission is to promote, restore, and protect the natural and cultural resources of the Russian River Area State Parks through uh, interpretation and public stewardship. And, and really, fundamentally, what stewards is, is stewards is the link between the people and the parks. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to be. And, and that's where you all come in. Um, stewards facilitates. Uh, but really volunteers are, are the crucial ingredient in the arrangement between uh, stewards and the parks. Um, we really rely on community members, folk naturalists, and you know, people that want to give back to the parks that have given them so much. Um, volunteers are, are the backbone of the state park system. Um, you know, the selfless, uh, participation of countless thousands of volunteers is, is really what allows us to keep all these wild spaces accessible to everybody. Um, so I can't overstate the importance of volunteer participation. Um, you know, and a, and a lot of what we do here at Stewards is interpretation. Um, we teach people how to look. Um, there's many different ways of looking. We, we teach people how to look and we, we help them still wonder um, by showing people how many unanswered questions are all around them. Um, and with, with the Sonoma Coast State Park, with the Whale Watch program, um, I think interpretation is particularly crucial. Um, oceans suffer in a way that's arguably even greater than the way that forests suffer. Um, you've got industrial overfishing, ocean acid, acidification, microplastic pollution. Um, these are all disasters that are unfolding in real time right now, um, but they're invisible to most people. And, and, and my hope is that volunteers uh, like yourself can provide a new lens to people um, to help them see what may have otherwise been invisible to them. And um, my hope is that um, by volunteers who, who help people uh, broaden their lens of vision, um, you're gonna help park visitors um, form a sense of belonging and responsibility and, and stewardship uh, for this entire world out in the ocean that they can't see. Um, so thank you for all participating in this, this really valuable work. It really can't be overstated just how valuable what volunteers contribute is.
Um, that's my rant. Um, so now I'm going to pass you over to the much more capable hands of Norma, I believe. Let's let Hollis go first with MPA. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I jumped, All right. sorry. I jumped the sorry. gun. Hollis, it's you. Are you driving? I am driving. You want me to put up the MPA? Yeah, please. Okay, give me one second. Screens up behind you. Mm -hmm. How you put those screens up behind you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in um, 1999, the California legislature passed the Marine Life Protection Act, and the intention is to um, is to protect marine life, not only marine life but um, entire ecosystems up and down our coastline. And by 2012, California finalized the nation's first statewide science-based network of marine protected areas. And it's the largest ecologically connected MPA network in the world. Um, it consists of 24 um, areas up and down our coast with different kinds of designations and different kinds of restrictions. Uh, next slide, please. So what are they? Um, they're designed to protect and conserve marine life and habitats. Um, the fishery management uh, will protect specific uh, species, like you have a, a season for salmon fishing, a season for um, dungeness crab, and those are designed to protect one species. The national marine sanctuaries, of which we have two off of our coast, are basically um, involved with um, what boats and ships can release into the water or if oil drilling is allowed. Um, but the California MPAs um, protect an entire ecosystem. And what this does is this protects the food chain. There are a lot of species of animals that move in and out of different areas throughout their life cycle. And it's much more comprehensive than um, either of the other kinds of protective agencies that we have. The next slide, please. So they protect a variety of habitats. And as I said, um, there are animals who um, will lay their eggs in one kind of habitat. Um, the larvae moves around um, into different other kinds of habitats. And so there's a connectivity and a flow of life which is protected, which isn't necessarily um, protected if you're, just, if you're just involved with one species. So the entire food chain is protected as well. And what this does is it not only protects the animals that live in these environments, but also those that depend upon these environments for making their living, such as birds and marine mammals. Next slide, please. So big old fat fertile female fish or boff. Unlike um, human females, as they age, fish become larger and they become more fertile. And so this slide shows um, a vermilion rockfish. And when it's 14 inches, it only produces about 150,000 eggs. But by the time that it gets old and is about two feet long, it can produce one point, up to 1.7 million eggs. And the thing about these fish is that um, they have a lifespan of up to 75 years, but they don't even begin egg laying until they hit their teens. So it's important that there's some means of protection to get them to that big fertile stage where um, they can reproduce enough in order to keep the species going and the species that depend upon them. Um, next slide, please. So what can you do in your MPAs? There are different kinds of designations. Um, there are the state marine preserves, and these are no take um, from either living or non living areas. There are state marine conservation areas, and you can take some species, either recreationally or commercially, with a license. And then there are um, uh, parks where you can take most species recreationally and commercially. And what we have along the Sonoma Coast or our section of the coast is that the Russian River has 
two designations as does Bottega Head where you, where you will be volunteering. So how do the no-take reserves work? There's larva that's protected and um, uh, it, they, they have an opportunity to grow and, and prosper in the protected areas. And then they move out into less protected areas, increasing the abundance for fishermen and other recreational um, um, consumptive activities in non-protective areas. Um, you'll see a map here of the Bodega Head SMR. And the SMR is a no-take area and it extends up beyond Muscle Point and includes the Bodega Marine Lab. And down below, there's a seam there, and that's the um, conservation area where uh, Dungeness crab by trap is allowed uh, seasonally. And what you'll see, and, oh, and also um, fish. So what you'll see when you're on Bodega Head and if you walk around on that trail, you'll often see boats that are sitting right on that seam. And that's because of the spillover. Because of the no-take area, there are fish and other wildlife that move out into the conservation areas and then out into Bodega Bay and the Pacific Ocean itself. Um, next slide, please. So um, the Russian River. The Russian River has um, two types, two designations. One is a conservation area, and that goes about a square mile offshore. And recreate, both recreational and commercial take of Dungeness crab by trap is allowed there. Um, then there is an area that is a recreation area that moves into the river as far as Bridgehaven. Um, at the Bodega Head SMCA, again, it's a recreational take of Dungeness crab, squid, and um, Thin fish, such as rockfish. Next slide, please. So the Russian River, um, there's a recreation area that extends from the mouth of the river upstream to Highway 1 at Bridgehaven. And it is a, um, it's an interesting area. There is, it's a no-take area with the exception of uh, hunting of waterfowl. And what happened, oh, I'm sorry, um, go back one. Andrew, I forgot something. Whoops. Okay. Um, I was talking about how um, it protects all of the ecosystem. And this includes things like crabs, clams, amphipods, all of those things that live on the soft bottom habitat. So for seal watch volunteers, for example, they often talk about seeing gray whales come up to the mouth of the river and they're scraping against the, the, the sandy bottom there and they're feeding. And so they benefit from the protection of these areas. Same thing happens off of the dig ahead. And obviously um, with the note take for fisheries, it's really good for the harbor seals that haul out there as well. Next slide, please, Andrew. So Bodega Head, where you will be, um, it has two different designations. Um, and again, sometimes you'll see gray whales come in close to feed. You'll often see humpbacks. All of these animals, you'll see um, sea lions that are porpoising down towards Bodega Rock. You'll see breeding birds, seabirds off of Bodega Head starting in April and May. These are all animals that benefit from these marine protected areas. So they're not only protecting the animals that live under the water, but also those that depend upon this environment for their, for their living as well. And I think that's it. Are there any questions? Do those areas extend onshore and is there any distance if they do? Onshore? 
Uh, yes. No, they're strictly marine, except um, the Russian River is, is not onshore, but it does go up the river as far as Bridgehaven, up to Highway 1. Okay, so it's just the aquatic areas that are basically to the high tide line. Uh, exactly. However, there are issues on shore that affect these protected areas. Obviously, litter, trash, all of those human activities on shore that impact what happens offshore. Okay. And that includes like fishing, you know, like surf casting from South Salmon Creek, for example, which is a no take area. Well, you're going into the water there. I haven't seen any fish that swinging around in the sand. So, no, uh -uh. I, I, I figured that part, but I was just curious because of seabirds and I mean, you're going to have the ones regarding seals and such about not disturbing them, but that's still, you get my drift on this. Right. Okay. Now, technically, um, the seabirds are protected by the uh, Migratory Bird Act, and the marine mammals are protected by the Marine Mammal Protective Act. However, um, one of the purposes of the MPA and their education is um, uh, human interference with those animals and protecting them from, from disturbances. Okay. I mean, it would be an offline one, not an offline one, but an odd one here, because the other thing that I was curious about too is I've seen Dungeonese further south where they have walked, or whatever you want to call it, crawled quite a bit into the dry zone. So I was just curious right. if any of that type of stuff that's not covered under special acts would be covered also. Oh, well, that would also, that would also be covered uh, with seasonally too, whether or not they're in season. I live in Stimson Beach. And then for some reason in October, the Dungeness start walking out of the ocean, you know, up onto the sand. Okay, and, that's what uh, I was talking course, about. Uh, pardon me? That's what I was talking about. Yeah, exactly. And the gulls, you know, it's just a feast to them. Okay. Thank you so much. I would love to see those crabs walking out of the water for the gulls. That sounds like quite something to see. Well, Andrew, one time we, we grabbed one and threw him back. <laughs> and he walked right back out and we grabbed him and we threw him back. And he walked right back out and he was legal size. So we right. brought him home. <laughs> <laughs> Kamikaze crabs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, <laughs> thanks so much, Hollis. Um, any more questions anyone has, if you could just type them in the chat and we'll try and get to them um, later in the presentation. Um, next up, Norma. Good morning, everyone. So I'm gonna talk about gray whales, which is the whale that we interpret about for the Whale Watch program uh, that Stewart sponsors. And uh, we do that from Bodega Head. But before I get started, I want to acknowledge thus the uh, beginning of Whale Watch, and that is that um, Zebron in 1986 uh, started Whale Watch. We call her, um, we used, to, uh, we called her our whale mother. And Whale Watch was the second volunteer program, Seal Watch being the first was the uh, in how, how stewards was initiated. And at the time it was called Stewards of Slavyanka, which is what the Russians called the Russian River. And then subsequently was renamed Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods, which really more uh, is, uh, identifies the volunteer programs and the resources, both the Redwoods and the coast that stewards protects and provides the volunteer programs for. So with that, I'll launch into the PowerPoint. Okay. One second. Okay. You see that? Hey, I can. Is there a way to reduce us? You know, on the right so that we're not blocking the PowerPoint, do you think? Because right now everybody that's on the call shows up on the screen. 
So the way to do that for participants, as well as yourself, Norma, um, you can do a presenter view, and then there's a slider if you hover between the PowerPoint and your video. I see a swap screen share. Well, all right, never mind. It's beyond my technical capability. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm going to talk about the natural history of the gray whale, and um, that's a great picture of uh, one where we can actually see the whole whale um, for a difference from what we might see in the water. Um, and I just want to point out that if you look at the, um, the flipper, you'll see it's kind of short and paddle shaped, and later on I'm going to say that but this is really the only picture I have that, that shows that. So um, the gray whale is uh, E. robustus um, and next slide, it's what we interpret at, at Bodega Head. Next slide. It seems very... There we go. So these uh, whales, they're Eastern Pacific gray whales. And, you know, they used to be called, and some people still call them California gray whales. But, you know, they migrate between uh, the Arctic, passing Alaska, Canada, Washington, Oregon, all the way down to Mexico. So they're not, they're not California whales. <laughs> they're Pacific gray whales. And they're specifically the Eastern Pacific gray whales because they're off. They're on the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean. So they're mammals, they're cetaceans, they're part of the whales and dolphins and porpoises family, and they're, they're um, baleen whales. And most of the large whales are baleen whales. So blue whales, fin whales, humpbacks, grays are examples of the um, baleen whales. And they're, they're coastal, so they're visible from the shore. You don't have to get in the boat. You don't have to worry about getting seasick can see them, particularly the grays from the coast, which is why we have a program off of um, at Bodega Head. There's also, you can see them from Point Reyes, from up in Point Arena. Scott Mercer's on this call. Scott and Tree do a great program up at uh, Point Arena. They're lucky because it juts way further out in the ocean and they see more whale types than we do. Um, and this, the gray whale migrate it's along the North American Pacific coast. And it, it moves, they move uh, from the Arctic Oceans where they feed into the lagoons on the Pacific side of Baja, California, essentially from about the middle of uh, Baja, called Baja Sur, south, and a little bit around into the Sea of Cortez. Next slide. So there, how do we how do we know we're looking at a, a gray whale? Well, it has a or, and what are some of the identifying um, aspects of a gray whale? It's it's got a fairly streamlined body and its its head is fairly narrow and tapered, and its skin is mottled gray, and that's because um, it it has scars on it from the barnacles that will often fall off. It doesn't have a top fin like uh, dolphins do, um, but instead it has some dorsal humps, about six to 12 knuckles. And I mentioned the flippers being paddle shaped from that first uh, slide. And then the fluke is about 10 to 12 feet across. It's kind of pointed at the tips and it has a deep notch in the center, which you can see from this particular photo of a diving gray whale. Next slide. So what, how big are these? Well, they're not the largest. Uh, they're not the largest baleen whale by, by any means. So, you know, the blue whale gets that designation of about 80 um, up to 100 feet, depending upon um, which population it's a part of. But it's, it's pretty decent size, 45, uh, 46 feet for a male. The females are larger around 45 to 50 to 55. And that's because, you know, they've got to carry a 12 to 15 foot, 1200 to 1500 pound calf. 
So the adults weigh about 45 tons, average 35. And the calves, as I just mentioned, are 1,500 to 2,000 pounds at birth. So that's some, you know, it's a, that's a pretty big baby. And the population, and I want to take a little pause to talk about the population. Um, I, I'm saying on this slide about 20,000. And um, I want to just say that for the last three years, we've been experiencing a UME is an unusual mortality event. And that has uh, impacted the number of whales in the population, the gray whales. And so right now, the estimate is that there's about 20,500 something, 580 uh, gray whales, which is down from about 26,000, 27,000 that it had increased, the population had increased to before this uh, die off began. Uh, we started to see it in about 2018 and it picked up in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And we began to see whales washing up dead on beaches up and down the California coast in the, in the lagoons in Baja and all the way up into Alaska. And the uh, belief is that, well, and we st also started to see the whales arriving later in the year in their uh, mating and feeding, uh, their mating and calving lagoons down in, uh, in Baja. But uh, as to why this is happening, there's many reasons and really uh, there is no specific you can point to, you know, some say when they got up to uh, 26,900, 27,000, that that was their carrying capacity from pre uh, whaling days. Uh, I think that's probably speculative as well. But also, what we're seeing uh, is skinny whales. And uh, that's because not getting enough food in their feeding grounds in Alaska. So, you know, they, they depend on uh, being able to bulk up and feed all summer long into the early fall before it starts to ice up in Alaska. And if they can't uh, get enough food, which they're bottom feeders, so they eat amphipods from the bottom sediment, then they're not able to bulk up to sustain them in their round trip. So the other thing we were seeing in the lagoons was uh, besides the skinny whales, sunken blowholes, is uh, protruding vertebrae and fewer mothers and calves. So, uh, you know, this, this phenomenon, and, and also I think in 2021, if you're in the Bay Area, you saw a number of uh, newspaper articles about gray whales washing up on beaches in the San Francisco Bay. That's another phenomenon that's starting to increase, which is an attempt to feed in areas where there is not that much food for them and they wouldn't normally be feeding um, because they're starving. They're not getting enough food in Alaska to sustain them. So this, this, uh, ha this circumstance of uh, the changing conditions in Alaska in the water, the warming waters, uh, lessening of their food source there, of their preferred prey, which is the amphipods that like that cold Arctic Ocean. So if it's warming, they're not, they're fewer. Um, they try to feed on other things that may not be as nutritious. So you know, there's, we have a a dynamic going on uh, that we still aren't really sure how this is all gonna work out, what's gonna happen to the population. And also we don't, this is a, a new year. So already in the early part of this year when they were down in the lagoons, this uh, phenomenon of skinny whales and not very many mother's calves was evident. We're going to see it again in the southbound migration and in this year, 2022, uh, in the lagoons is to be determined. Okay, next slide. So what's the life cycle? Well, 
they reach sexual maturity between five to 11 years or around 36 to 40 feet, um, you know, average eight. The mother carries her calf 12 to 13 months. And this is always kind of a fun interpretation point when you have a pregnant mother uh, who comes to visit at the head and you kind of ask, well, after nine months, you're pretty eager to have that baby. Think what it might be like to have to carry it for 13 months. And um, they only have a calf every two years or more because of the gestation time and what it takes away from the mother to be able to sustain the calf while it is uh, growing. And the mother is going to nurse the calf seven to eight months. So when it, they're born in the, in the lagoons in Baja, they um, were on the southbound migration off of Southern California around San Diego, LA, San Diego, where the water begins to get warmer. But then even at that point, they generally will take the calf down into the lagoons. So they begin to nurse the calf. They do it throughout the time that they're in the lagoons the way on the northbound migration and then into the time when they're in Alaska until they are able to eat like the majority of the adults do by um, going after the amphipods that live in the bottom sediment. So unlike the milk that we drink, the percentage of fat for a gray whale is 53%. So it's like quite a bit more fat content, which is critical because the baby has to double its, its size and weight in the period of time that it's learning to swim and getting strong enough to migrate north with the mother. And that fat content of that milk enables the calf to grow Just quickly, actually, when you think about it. Next slide. So what's the life cycle? What are these? whales that we see going by, what, what, are they do, what are they doing? So they're, as I said, most, they breed on the South by migration where the waters get a little bit warm off of Southern California. And then in these specific lagoons of Baja, um, they're from Baja Sur down Ojo de Liebre, uh, Laguna de San Ignacio and the Bahia Magdalena Bay. And the, there are some programs, there are some tourist programs, some whale watching programs, particularly in San Ignacio, where people go to be able to have close encounters and see the whales and go out in little pongas and get uh, and have the whales come up to them in the boat and be able to have a, a close encounter. So, um, they're, they feed mostly in Alaska, in the Chukchi, Beaufort, in the North Bering Seas, about you know five months until the ice forms. And of course, we were seeing the southbound migration and the arrivals in the lagoons happening later. And I, um, I think we can say that that's because they were eating longer. The ice it wasn't icing up as early. And they were trying to get more and more food in them to assist them in making that migration because for the most part, they do not eat during the migration. They, so why, they, why they're feeding, feeding, feeding all summer, fall up in Alaska is to bulk up with enough fat and blubber to sustain them throughout the migration south Mexico and back up to Alaska because mostly they they don't feed. Oh, Are opportunistic feeders? Yeah. They will feed if they come upon a, a krill bloom in the ocean. They certainly can gulp in the krill, but because they're bottom feeders, they really depend upon uh, being able to get to the amphipods that are that live in the bottom sediment in Alaska. So um, this is where I want to take a, a, a minute to talk about the Western Pacific gray whale population. So there's between two and 300 whales, gray whales, um, uh, that 
that live on the west side of uh, the Pacific Ocean off of Kamkatcha, um, Shahaklin and Island off of Russia and down into South Korea. And the interesting thing about that is that well, those whales, you know, there used to be an Atlantic population and they um, are, are extinct now. But on the Pacific side, on the west side, western side, that western Pacific group, um, they have begun to show up in the lagoons in Baja. So the uh, San Ignacio has an ecosystem science program that monitors the gray whales that are in that particular lagoon uh, to mate and to calve. They have seen um, over time, both from tagging and from photo ID, about 57 whales crossing over from Russia to uh, the lagoons and also along the uh, west coast of California, uh, Washington, and Oregon. And so um, that's, that's kind of interesting. Actually, in 2014, a female who was tagged was monitored and she swam from um, that, uh, let's say it right, the, the Hackland Island, um, all the way across to Mexico and then back in, uh, in 172 days. So she swam 14,000 miles, which is the longest migration of any mammal that has been recorded. So. What we're seeing also is a, a Pacific Coast feeding group. So a couple of hundred, maybe more now, who uh, are trying, who are feeding over the summer in various locations between uh, the Kodiak Island area, along Oregon and Depot <laughs> Bay. There's a very, um, there's a summering over <laughs> of quite a number of gray whales in, Depot Bay, and there's actually a, a whale watch program there that's led by a, a lady who's an instructor from uh, an Oregon University and has written a couple of books with many, many pictures uh, IDing the gray whales that come back every summer to Depot Bay. And also, um, I think Scott and Tree will tell you that they have been, they see. Uh, whales off of Point Arena in the summer. And uh, one of our Whale Watch volunteers, Sherry Goforth EB, has been photographing gray whales around in the Gualala area. And, and so it has recognized the return of similar whales um, over, over various summers. And a couple of summers we have actually had off of Bodega Head some whales that hung around for some, uh, beyond when they normally would have been gone up into Alaska to feed um, off, of, off of Bodega Head. Although, you know, I will note that there isn't much in the way of food for them off of Bodega Head. Let's go to the next slide. So what's, what's their migration? I mentioned that that 14,000 round trip, uh, 14,000 mile round trip of the whale that swam from Russia over to the, um, to the East Coast, if you will, or the West, west Coast of, of California, depending on your perspective. But their, their usual migration is about a, a, an average of 12,000 miles. And that, you know, that depends upon where do they start are they in the Bering, the Chukchi, or the Beauforts? And where do they go? Do they go to Ojo de Liebre? Do they go to Laguna San Ignacio? Do they go to Bahia Magdalena? Or do they go around into the Sea of Cortez? Pretty much they have a fidelity to the lagoons that they go to every year and where they um, have their calves and where the calves are born. So they, they start their... And it's one of the longest of all mammal migrations, migration that they do. Um, southbound, they start around October, ice up again, you know, it really depends on what's going on in the ocean. 
when that happens. Um, so then they head south for several months. We see them in the southbound migration closer um, out to the horizon because they're using the California current, which is out there. And they're in the lagoons and the lagoons are mating lagoons and calving lagoons. So they go to the lagoons to mate. It's kind of their, you know, vacation. I don't know, to anthropomorphize. They go to have fun, to party, to, um, to mate. Uh, and only the adults make that trip. The juveniles don't go to the lagoons because they're not sexually mature and there's really nothing in it for them to be down there. But the, the uh, pulse of the adults does go south past us, as I said. We'll, we see them pretty much no, starting in November, December, but we start whale watch in January when the southbound migration is still happening. So uh, January and February, we'll see them cl usually closer out to the horizon. Then um, they're in the lagoons mating and calving for a couple of months, three months, four months, depends. And then they start their northbound migration back up to Alaska. This time, they're much closer to shore because they're using the Davidson current, which is a closer in current. And the first, like, like with the southbound migration, we will often see the first ones to go by will be the pregnant females or hot, 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 going down fast to get to the lagoons to have that calf. Um, the first ones north are the newly pregnant females because they want to get up to Alaska to begin to feed again because now they're pregnant and they have to sustain not just themselves but a calf. So we, we start to see that in mid-February. We call that the crossover time because we'll still be seeing some southbound, usually the juveniles, but then we'll also be seeing the, new, the newly pregnant females northbound trying to get up to the feeding grounds. Then they're followed by the males, the immature males and females. And the very last of the migration happens between about mid-April till the end of May, early June usually, although the peak is in May. Um, and that's the cows and the calves, the moms and the, and the babies. And they're closest to shore. And why? Because the calf is still nursing. It's a baby and it needs to rest. So what, what we see is that the female, the mom keeps the calf between her and the uh, cliffs of the ocean. And she's doing that for a couple of reasons. One is um, to keep the calf safe from the echolocation capabilities of the orca, because the orca is the only predator of the, of the grays and the orca go after the calves and the, by going closer to shore, it's, um, more, it's more shallow and she's trying to protect the calf from that echolocation by the, by the, um, by the orca. Um, so, and, and along the shore, there are little bays that she can, go into to pause so that the calf can rest and she can then you know, take time to nurse because the calf is being nursed, again, remind, remember, all the way up in, into Alaska. And um, off, at the head, often what we'll see is that the, they'll come around the tip of Point Reyes and then they come at the head sort of at an angle and we'll see them rest on side of the head that uh, faces the jetty entrance into the harbor and then Bodega Rock. And they'll rest there and they'll nurse and then they'll come around the tip and come right past us such that you feel like you could reach down and touch them because they're right there in the shallows um, right, off of, right off of where we stand to interpret. This is just an illustration 
of uh, that migration route that I mentioned, going, going from Mexico all the way up into Alaska. Next slide. So why does it take them so long to get from Alaska down to Mexico? Well, because they're slow. They're slow swimmers. They're only swimming like three to five miles an hour, maybe seven. So that's a, that's, that doesn't cover a lot of distance when you're talking about 10, 12,000 mile migration. Um, it takes a while. And, and how do we see them? Well, we look for their blows. And that's particularly critical on the southbound migration when they're closer out to the horizon look for the blows to, to let us know that there's a whale. And they're, they blow, you know, like three to five times, maybe 15 to 30 second intervals, and then they'll dive. They'll be under for maybe two minutes to five minutes, but they can stay under for about 15 minutes. And these uh, two uh, photos here are illustrations of what their blow looks like, bushy or heart-shaped. And we have a, we have a joke that They'll, they'll, be, they'll be coming by us at the head and we'll see the blows and we'll see the backs and we'll see the tails. And then all of a sudden they'll go under and they'll disappear. Mm -hmm. So we think that, you know, we say, oh, well, they go, they went into the tunnel and they'll shoot out past Horseshoe Cove, past Bodega Marine Lab, which is just to the north of us. Next slide. What do they eat? As I mentioned, amphipods that live in the sediment up in the shallow, very cold Arctic seas. Um, they also will eat ghost shrimp in up in Depot Bay in the kelp beds up there. They, they like to strip the ghost shrimp off of those. They, they eat about a ton a day during the, the time uh, they're in Alaska. And when they're up there, it's pretty much 24 hours of daylight. And it's estimated that they're eating about 67 tons during that time that they're on the feeding grounds. And that um, they're, they're storing up fat and blubber, which they're going to live off of during the migration south and back north. And um, pretty, it's a pretty fascinating thing to think about eating that much food and having access to that much the, of the amphipods to be able to put on that blubber uh, to get them down and back. Next slide. So why are they gray modeled? Because they're covered with barnacles. And there are um, three kinds of lice on the, uh, the, bar the barnacles are found, uh, this particular barnacle is only found on the gray whale and it pretty much lives out its life cycle on the whale. Down in the lagoons where the water's warm, they um, attach onto the whale and they pretty much live out their life cycle on the whale. And around the barnacles, you will see lice. And there are three kinds of lice on uh, and around the barnacles of the gray whale two of which are only on the gray whale. And one you might recognize if you know um, Scammon from the whaling days. And he was a, a, a great whaler who went on to become a naturalist, but one of the um, kinds of lice um, that's only on the gray is carries his name. And I'll take the next slide. So again, I mentioned the baleen whale, uh, it has baleen only in its upper jaw, about 130 to 180 plates on either side of its jaw, but only on the upper jaw. And it's keratin. So it's the same thing as your hair and your fingernails. And it sifts its food. So it, when, when they're feeding in Alaska, they go down on their right side, they're right-sided, we know that because most of the barnacles get rubbed off on the right side. So when we have a, um, a whale that, that dies and washes up on a beach, most of the barnacles are rubbed off on the right side. So it goes down, it sucks in mud and water 
it pushes the mud and water through the baleen with its tongue. And then those little amphipods get caught in the, the, the bushy hairs of the baleen. Uh, the bushy part is on the inside of the baleen plates. And then the whale licks it off and swallows. And the other uh, interesting thing is often when, when kids are there with their parents and there's a father uh, or a male figure with them that's tall, we say, um, well, how tall is your dad? Oh, well, you know, they don't know. And the dad will say, oh, you know, I'm 5'10", I'm six foot, whatever. And we say, well, you know, this whale's head alone is seven feet. And why do we know that? Because there's craters in the mud up in Alaska where they feed that are seven feet the size of their head, which they're going down and sucking in the mud on you know, their heads, what's going down. Okay, next slide. This is a picture of an, in, an entire, uh, the, the bones of a gray whale. And I took it up in uh, Washington. Diane, you were, at this, um, you were at this museum when we emailed one time. But anyway, I took this because it's the only time I've ever seen an intact structure with the baleen plates also, um, you know, in, in the, the mouth of the whale. So you can really see what it looks like. And you, this also gives you a chance to see the vertebrae. You can see a little bit of the, um, the flippers. They have fingers like, you know, we have fingers and a thumb and you can see the bones. Uh, in, in there on, on this particular specimen. So um, we have up at, up at the head, we have a, a piece of baleen, we have ribs, we have vertebrae, um, and we have whale lice, and we have a barnacle from a whale. So we have all of these specimens of a juvenile, they're all from a juvenile gray whale we can show and we do show to visitors at, at the head. I think I'm at the end. Um, am I at the end of the slides? Yeah, I think so. Just a couple of photos. One really great one showing the whale coming out where you can see the baleen plates um, on the top part of, of its jaw and then the mother and the calf a, this picture was taken in the lagoons um, in San Ignacio, where um, most of us who are coordinators have been. And I just do want to take real, a real quick opportunity to say that besides uh, me and Rich and Colleen, Rich Draffin and Colleen Draffin, who you'll hear from in a minute, um, the other weekend coordinators are Sandra Bug. Goldman and Richard Ships. We couldn't do it without uh, weekend coordinators. We couldn't do Whale Watch. And um, all of these folks are veteran uh, whale watchers and they know a lot about the whales and they uh, will help all of the new volunteers as you learn to um, interpret these uh, the gray whales. And also we give you, let's see, I have it here somewhere. What we have available is a, a whale a card, which is also on uh, the website, by the way. It's uh, whale watching and Pacific gray whale facts. There's some great pictures of the mom and a calf off of uh, the head and uh, at the mouth of the Russian River. And then some of the uh, folks doing whale watch and then on the back are all kinds of facts. So it's a takeaway for people to be able to, uh, when they leave, if they want to talk to their friends about, hey, did you know, do you know how big a whale is? How big a gray whale is? Or how big the head is? Or how big the tongue is? Or how big it is? How long they carry their calves? The, the facts are on the back of this card. So I recommend it to you. As I said, it's on the website, the steward's website under volunteer, California, let's see, state beaches, right? And there's what there's a site for 
Whale Watch, and there's a lot of also um, recommended reading material is there, books um, that you could look at, um, some of which are um, stories about the migration and others are actual um, guides. So that's it for me. Thank you. Great, thanks, Nola. Um, did you want me to show that video of the mother and the calf? Um, well, I think it might be fun. Uh, you know, I don't know. We'll see if we really want to say anything about it. But you know, a lot of a lot of people are very interested in knowing about where do the whales? What does it look like? Can we go there? And so, um, this is a video of uh, a mother and calf in the lagoons in uh, Mexico. So it, it's rather heartening to see what they look like, what the baby looks like and how friendly um, the baby really can be. Sure, give me one second to pull that up. Uh, there we go. Okay, so So one thing I do want to say when you're seeing these calves, why, why do they go to Baja? You know, why don't they just have their calves at Bodega Head? Well, you know, there's Michelle. She's thrilled to have the opportunity to see a cow because it's warm. And when they're born, they have no blubber to keep them warm. The waters are warm. Waters have a high salt content, so they're very buoyant, which allows the, the calves to, to be high in the water to learn to swim and the mother to have an easier time of nursing. So that, that particular environment in the lagoons is, is why they go there. And it, it's very important for them um, to go there. And of course, I guess for the adults who are on vacation mating, it's kind of a night, it's kind of a refreshing difference from ice cold Arctic oceans. And they're very, they're very curious so that you can see them, the mothers and the calves will often come right up to the boat that you're in, which the boat stops. You, know, you don't go after the whales, you stop the boat and the whales come to you. So there's a baby, you can see the difference, hardly any barnacles and the mother's covered with barnacles. Sometimes you'll see the baby laying across the back of the mother taking a little rest. Paddle shaped. Yeah. There again. See the eye? There's that was the picture, the great picture of the of a calf laying across the mom. Yeah. Right. I think there were some uh, there were some questions in the chat. There's a lot of questions in there. Wanna... Um. Yeah, somebody wants to know whether those brochures will be at the visitor center in Bodega Bay. I don't think they're there. Um, I'll, I'll call Emily and ask her. 
I don't recall. Maybe they are, but it's been so long since I've been in the visitor center, I don't remember. Okay. And um, somebody else wants to know uh, where do the babies go to stay safe when the mums go to breed in the lagoons? Well, once the, once the, the calves, uh, once the mother takes the calf north for the first time into the oceans in Alaska, it learns to feed and it's on its own. There's no more, I mean, they don't hang out with their mother forevermore. They're on their own. And so there isn't um, a need to, for the calf to be protected any longer. That protection is necessary on the northbound migration when they're still calves, they're babies, they're still being nursed, and they need to stop and rest. And are they protected? Well, they're, they're an in, they are endangered. They're off the endangered species list. Um, so are they protected? They're protected in these lagoons in um, Baja where they mate and have their calves. But other than that, um, they're pretty much on their own during the migration. And, you know, they, they run a gauntlet all the way up the coast with many, many vessels. Um, there, there are a lot of vessel strikes, not just of grays, but of humpbacks and blues and fins. That's why right now um, there's no crab feeding, commercial crab feeding, because of the potential for entanglement, pretty much of humpbacks, but of any uh, grays that would that might be out there. Um, there's a lot of noise in the ocean, so the the noise from ships and um, other 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 noise sources uh, impact their ability to communicate, and it also uh, can impact their um, health. But along uh, along their journey, there's really um, other than like when they come in uh, off of the coast of uh, San Francisco, because it's in a national marine sanctuary. Often the uh, marine sanctuary will put out a slow a slow order to the ships that are coming into uh, San Francisco Bay to offload to slow them down to reduce the potential for ship strikes. Mm. They don't need very deeply because they're they don't they're one of the whales that doesn't need deep water. That's why we're lucky we see them off the coast off the head. That's pretty shallow, sixty feet. I mean it's. I don't need deep water like the blue. We would never see a blue up against the bodega head like we see the grays because they're too huge. They're, they're off a mile, two miles off in the ocean. They need deep water. Grays don't need deep water. Okay. Maybe um, Rich and Drafting, Rich and Colleen, maybe you can take a couple of questions. <laughs> I think that's all the questions oh, we is? have for now. Um, and I just thought I'd chime in and say that 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 um, the slow orders that boats are given during the migration season in San Francisco, unfortunately, those slow orders are not mandatory. They are suggestions. Right. And often shipping companies do not follow them because they would rather offload their goods faster and make yeah. more money and continue to put the whales at risk. So yeah, that's sure. something to think about. Why aren't those slow waters mandatory and why aren't they enforced by law? It's yeah. a, it's an interesting had, thing to had consider. Ships come into the San Francisco Bay with a fin, a dead fin whale on the prowl of the ship. And of course the ship doesn't even know that it hit it. You know, yeah. where, you know, if you hit it with a commercial boat, probably they would know, but a tanker yeah. or, you know, um, container ship doesn't know when when they hit a whale and if you're only going three to five miles an hour as a gray or 10 you know or so miles an hour as a humpback or whatever uh, blues don't don't um, swim that much that fast either that big of a, a boat would never know that they hit a, a whale um Okay, so should we move on to Colleen and Rich Draffin? You want to talk about the program logistics for Whale Watch? 
Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Rich Draffen, my wife, Colleen. Uh, like many of the volunteers, we've been uh, out doing whale watch at Bodega Head for over 30 years and had a pretty, um, uh, pretty well organized routine that we, that we went, to, went through. But uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic, we've not been able to uh, do the whale watch the last couple of years. So this will be our first time back out at the head. And uh, it's, it's going to be an evolving learning process uh, as we try to uh, figure out how to interact with, with the people, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, be mindful of the COVID restrictions. Um, the, uh, you know, all of the volunteers will be asked to wear uh, a mask while they're on duty and uh, to maintain uh, distance from, from, the, um, from the public as much as possible. Um, and, but and we've got to remember too that we are docents, we're there to uh, help interpret and as Andrew said to help people learn how to look for whales and where to see them and how to spot them. Um, we're not there to uh, limit people's access or uh, restrict their interaction and I want to make it uh, I want everybody to understand that if at any point in time while they're on duty, duty, if they are uncomfortable with the uh, the situation, they're uncomfortable with the the way that the crowd is behaving. That they should simply they should simply leave the head, and either come down uh, where we'll be located uh, at the entrance to the head, or, or just you know get in their car and uh, you know chill out for a little bit. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the way we're set up at the head, they, uh, there is a large parking lot, uh, that's bordered with, um, like telephone poles that, uh, shows where the, where the parking up. is. Just hold on one second. Andrew, can you put up that, um, aerial of the, of the head? Oh, that was sure. Give me one second. Sure. Go ahead, Rich, because we've got that great aerial uh, showing okay. where we are. Yeah, you know, there's a very large parking lot uh, right uh, right there at the head, and and uh, a space in the um, in the logs that they've used to surround the lot. There is a space that allows people to walk through and to walk out up on the head itself. Um, we will we will be having only six volunteers for each shift. Okay, there's the uh, there's the the road going out to the head and the large parking lot um, right out on the uh, on the cliff edge. So as I say, we will have. Uh, six volunteers on each shift. The shift will last from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, the way we envision it at this point is that four of the volunteers would be positioned up on the head itself, uh, helping people spot the whales, uh, monitor their progress, uh, you know, across the horizon. Uh, yeah, we'll be answering questions as well as providing information. Um, and then there will be two individual, two of the volunteers will remain down near the parking lot at the entrance to the head where they will have uh, the items of display that Norma talked about. The baleen, the whale bones, the uh, uh, the barnacle, the whale lice, um, 
Now, the, the plan at this point in time uh, is not to do it as we've done in the past. We've had these items laid out for display and we've encouraged people to, to pick them up, to handle them, to move them around. Um, what we're planning to do this year is to have the docents uh, have access to the display items to use them, to speak to the public, to, to, to hold them and display them, but not to, not to allow people to, to handle things. Um, as I say, we're, we're still, we're still uh, working on the actual physical uh, way that we'll lay things out. And uh, I'm sure that as, as time goes on through the season, that we'll, we'll modify things based upon what we learn. The, uh, the weather out at the head can be quite variable and is often different from what is ex being experienced inland. So uh, we encourage you to bring coats, bring gloves, uh, bring anything you feel you'd need to, uh, to keep warm or protect you from the rain. Um, to bring a lunch, since we'll be there from 10 to 2. Uh, if you have some food, we'll try to uh, facilitate or uh, allow break times for people to go and, and have a quick bite to eat. Um, the uh, one of the things we'll be covering here in a little bit is how to actually sign up on the calendar, how to how to schedule yourself for a a ten to two shift. Um, we'll need that information as well as your contact information, because if the coordinator for the day determines either as a result of the forecast or uh, based on uh, direct observation, if they determine that the weather is not going to be suitable, they will contact you and, and uh, let you know that the whale watch is being canceled for a given day. If you come out at any point and the, uh, and the coordinator determines that we have to cancel after you've come out and arrived, you'll get credit for having worked the, uh, the full shift. Okay. When yeah. we were talking about weather, um, Rich mentioned that, uh, you know, that rain, sometimes we do have a lot of rain out there. You never know whether you're going to get you know, beautiful day, wind, rain, whatever. And so that again, be sure and bring lots of uh, layers in your car and then so you can access them <laughs> as needed. But the other thing, um, when it, if it does rain, we don't stay out there. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll sit in our cars for a while and wait and see what's gonna happen. Because remember that we are there to, um, help the people uh, see the whales. And if it's raining, generally they don't come and stand on the head for very long at all either. They'll go back to their cars. So that kind of is a natural way to see whether or not we should stay out there. The other thing that I always think of is I was surprised early on when we came out to see that there's no barricade, no fencing. Um, on the edge of the cliff there. And um, in that way, we have the wonderful natural uh, look and everything. But at the same time, it can be a little nerve wracking for volunteers because I have seen many times people getting too close to the edge and just, it's, it's really hard to, to um, watch. However, we are not the police. We can't, you know, be out there. Some of some people are much more comfortable doing that. 
the only time the exception I make is if it's a child and especially an unattended child, I would step in. But otherwise, um, we really just need to, you know, hope that people will remember that uh, if they fall off or whatever, that we may never see them again. Probably not, I guess. Anything else to add to that? No. On that happy no. note? <laughs> yeah. No, on your, uh, upon your arrival out at the head, um, we ask that you check in with the coordinator, uh, get your name checked off the list that, uh, that, that we'll have there, and get a vest. So everyone will be wearing a distinctive green vest that has large letters on the back saying whale watch and a uh, state parks badge. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, that we ask for the most part that, you know, as long as you're on duty that you keep those, the vest on and um, so that you are identifiable as someone who can answer questions or provide information. That we ask also that you don't leave the whale watch area with your vest on. Oh, if you, for some reason, at, during your break for lunch, you decide you want to walk up uh, the path um, further out on the head, which you can see in that picture goes toward that pocket beach, that you take your vest off. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think uh, this is probably as, as, uh, as organized or as uh, um, as structured as we've been able to figure out at this point. There's going, it's going to be a learning experience for all of us. And um, we're hoping to, you know, take it one, one step at a time, but it should be, it, it, sh it should be great to be back after two years. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, have a couple more questions. Um, uh, when will when when will the program restart? Somebody asked. I think I think they mean down in the lagoons. I mean, because there are no tours um, associated with our whale watch program. But but the but the whale watch itself starts January first runs through the end of May and it's every weekend Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 2 with the exception of the weekend when when there's Fisherman's Festival down at Westside Park and I think that's the last week of April and uh, the last day of April the first day of May um, I think that's I think that really is what that question is trying to get at and then what determines what cancels besides rain well if it's 20 plus mile an hour winds and you can't stand up out there, we're not going to do whale watch because what's going to happen is people are going to get out of their car. They're going to take two or three steps up on the hill and then they're going to turn around and get right back in the car. You can't keep the materials on the table. So um, if we, we watch and we see there's a small craft advisory and there are high winds expected, We'll probably cancel. There have also been uh, days where the the road out to Bodega Bay, out to Bodega Head, has been uh, flooded and closed. And so, um, if we have that kind of a situation, uh, that that could also affect that determination. Okay, so the wind might actually affect it at twenty knots or twenty miles per hour. Well, it, it, it affects whether or not people are willing to stand out in that, <laughs> including us. <laughs> That's fine. I'm, I'm used to the, the bay where 20 knots is July, so. Oh, <laughs> you're yeah. tough. <laughs> yeah, I used to have a sailboat coming out of Coyote, and oh. if I tried to go out or come in before noon or afternoon and before dusk, forget it. <laughs> Well, as Colleen mentioned, one of the, the uh, determining factors is whether or not we have people to talk to, people to interpret for um, 
if all of a sudden we look around and the only people standing out on the head because of conditions are four volunteers and we have nobody else, uh, that would also be a, uh, uh, an instance where we might cancel if it looked like those conditions were gonna continue. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, so now you've heard quite a bit about the program and um, the nature of it, what you'll be doing out there. Um, now I want to hand it over to Amelia Shaw, who is the district volunteer coordinator, to talk a little bit about the logistics of actually signing up uh, as a state parks volunteer to, to be part of this program. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, as Andrew said, I'm Amelia Shaw, the Sonoma Mendocino Coast District Volunteer Coordinator for California State Parks. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go over all the steps of the registration process. And um, the very first step, if you're interested in volunteering, is to fill out the volunteer application. I've put a link in the chat to um, get to that application. And then you would want to send it to Andrew. And I'm putting his email address in the chat as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. This is what the application looks like. Um, I just put the link in the chat and um, it really gets us, it gives us some information to know what your interests are and get the process started. Um, the next step will be to fill out the paperwork. Uh, we can provide hard copies if needed. I'm gonna go through all the forms. I know um, y'all are in different uh, stages of the sign-in process. Some of you have already done some of this, but I'll try to make it quick. Um, the volunteer COVID-19 agreement um, acknowledges that you're aware of the pandemic and that you will agree to follow our policies. Um, like Rich mentioned, uh, you will be expected to wear a mask on duty and try to maintain distance. Um, we also currently have a vaccination reporting requirement for volunteers. So all volunteers are required to provide proof of vaccination or undergo weekly COVID-19 testing. Um, these tests are provided on our take home PCR test. And I will send an email with all of the details about that. Um, the next form of the paperwork that's required is the volunteer service agreement. It's one of the main forms. Um, it's also referred to as the 208. And this form, um, once completed, if you happen to be injured while performing your volunteer duties, uh, you may be covered by the department's workers' comp policy. And you just need to sign it down here. Um, you can just skip the back. And the next really important form for signing up as a volunteer is the duty statement. Um, and here's the duty statement for Whale Watch. And if you just sign the bottom of that one. And then the next form is pre-designation of personal physician. So if you did get injured while performing your volunteer duties and you would like to be seen by a particular physician, that's what this form is for. And the essential functions health questionnaire, it's one of the most confusing forms that you just need to fill out this top section, refer to the duty statement for the duties. And on the back, just check one of these boxes. Um, Fill in these areas if you need reasonable accommodation and sign the bottom. 
And then lastly, there's the visual media consent. If you're okay with us using your picture, um, it's optional. But you put your name here and sign here, fill out this part if you like. And then there's more details about that form on the next page. Um, the next thing I want to show you is how to report your volunteer time. So you can access the database that California State Parks uses to keep track of volunteer time by going to the stewards website. If you go to the volunteer tab here at the top of the page and go down to the fourth volunteer portal, that's one way to get there. We can also um, send a link directly to you via email. Um, but if you click that, it'll look like this. And it's the stewards of the Coast and Redwoods page on the volunteer portal. And there's a button over here on the right that says fill in an application. So you would click that. And if you don't have a profile on this Better Impact software yet, you would sign in on the left side where it says, I am new. Um, just create a username. And it'll turn red if, if you need to edit it. It's not available. Um, and then enter your email address. asks you to enter your email address twice. And then you need to check this box that says, I agree to the policies. Um, you can read what you're agreeing to here by clicking this blue button. Um, and then save and continue. I'm gonna fill all of this out right now, but I'm just gonna run through. Um, every field marked with one of these little flags is required. So you'll create a password, put your name in. <clears throat> a mailing address is best to put here because we can use um, this information to mail out the passes um, around the turn of the year. And then at least enter one phone number, please. And your birthday, and then you'll save and continue. After clicking the recapture, I'm not a robot box. Um, and then there'll be one more page that asks about your interests and your availability. And um, there will also be a section about qualifications, which you don't need to worry too much about because we will go in and set up your database profile for you so that it's connected to the correct activities. Um, and it also asks for um, who to contact in case of emergency information like that. But only the fields with a flag beside them are required. And then at the bottom of the next page, it'll say submit application. So you just click that. And once you have finished that process, um, we will need to go in to get it set up and verified before it will be available for you to log in but we'll let you know when it's ready and we'll give you some more details about how to enter time at that time. Um, and once we do that, the next step is to log in. Um, you can log in at myvolunteerpage.com. And the homepage will Look like this. Um, and then the main thing that we use the database for is to keep track of time. So you'll see this tab at the top labeled hours. Click that tab. And the next screen will show a drop down list of activities. Um, and you should see Whale Watch after we've gotten it set up for you. And you just enter the date. It automatically has the date of the day. 
that you're entering the hours um, and your four hours through a whale watch that and it asks for feedback so you can write um, whatever you like, but you know, maybe how many people you interacted with or anything you'd really like to say. Um, and then just push save. And then it'll show up there. Um, does anybody have any questions? On the paperwork that, that we actually physically sign, uh, mm -hmm. is that all one one continuous packet, or are there different pages? Um, it is a couple different forms. We don't have it all combined into one packet, um, but we will send all of the all of the different forms to you. At the moment, I think it's about three three different forms um, right. that we send them to you all at the same. They're mostly combined in one packet, but then there's the additional um, volunteer COVID-19 agreement, which is um, just hopefully temporary, and the duty statement particular to the program that you're doing will be included as well. Cool. All right, thank you, Amelia. Um, and I, I just want to point out that um, you know, you, you have to log your hours if you'd like to use your hours towards um, getting a um, district parks pass, um, which is 24 hours of volunteer work or um, a state um, parks pass, which is Amelia, it's 175 right now, isn't it? Yeah, this year it was lowered, the requirement was lowered to earn a statewide pass to 175 hours. Generally it's 200 hours. Which, uh, which all the volunteers tell me is far easier to log 175 hours than you might think it would be. Um, even if that doesn't appeal to you, um, logging your hours for a district or state pass, please log your hours um, anyway. It really helps us um, allocate resource and it really helps us um, with reporting for grants and trying to secure more funds for, for these programs to expand and continue these programs. And if you ever have any trouble, please reach out. Um, we can we can work out, you know, another way if you need, you know, we're, we're here to help you. <laughs> yeah, another question. Absolutely. Uh, I, mean, I was I, looking through, I was looking through the different volunteer stuff. Is there a training for the state parks that we have to do also? Um, there, well, there is. Uh, if all new volunteers for Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods are required to attend one general orientation. General orientations happen three times a year. Um, if you wanna get started with Whale Watch straight away um, and not wait for the next general orientation, which isn't until early next year, um, that's completely understandable. Um, and we can direct you to um, a recording of the last general orientation. And if you could just watch that uh, that would be great because that gives you some good basic information about the organization, what we do, what um, the other programs are, um, just a general code of conduct kind of thing, um, and um, you know who to reach and who to talk to for various issues you might have. So um, I can point you to those videos on the website and you can watch those so we don't have to wait a couple of months to get you started. If you would, please, that was a concern for me. Yeah, um, uh, Justin just threw a link in the chat to um, a general orientation video. So if you could watch that, that would be fantastic. And that will bring you all up to speed. I'm on a phone. Could you potentially email that to me? Absolutely. No problem. Thank Let you. me just make a note of that. Okay. Uh, Amelia, um, would you be able to address the COVID vaccine requirements for volunteers? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, um, it's required to provide proof of vaccination or um, undergo weekly testing. Um, I will send more details via email. Um, but if you do need to undergo weekly testing, the tests are provided and they are PCR tests to be self-administered at home. Did you have any um, specific questions that you wanted no. to ask? No, thank you, Amelia. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, the only other thing to go over just quickly is scheduling. Um, so I'll sh one thing that I should note is that, um, you know, for every shift up there on the head, there's going to be two coordinators and then a maximum of six uh, volunteers for the moment. Um, so, you know, if you see, um, if you go to book a shift and you see that there's already six people and two coordinators listed, um, you will not be able to book a shift. Um, so it's a maximum of six right now, and that's uh, for a number of reasons, but partially it's uh, um, uh, due to COVID concerns and wanting to create a situation where we can maintain social distance. So Sometimes me... we only have one coordinator, Al, uh, Andrew, but mostly we have two. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, let me just share my screen for a second. Okay. Andrew, this is Colleen. Um, is there a chance we can see who else is here in this meeting? That's one of the great things is to kind of see who the new people are and that sort of thing. Um, probably can if you hit the yeah, grid. Scroll down, scroll down from the on the right hand side screen where we are just keep hitting that arrow down you can see everybody that's on yeah the little oh, arrow okay. at the bottom of your screen oh, that's there's a participants tab participants. we had at max 27 participants and now we're at 24 and if anyone wants to introduce themselves or share why they're interested in volunteering please. richard's on with us that's great Jerry's on. Okay. We have quite a few of the, um, some of the coordinators and veterans are on with us. Right. Okay. Hi, this, this is Heather. I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Heather Rowe. I'm new to the organization, um, somewhat new to Sonoma County. I've been here for about four years. Um, I have a, a degree. Um, in integrative biology, I'm not working in the field of science, however. Um, so this is a bit of an avocation and I would love to um, get more involved. So thank you for putting this um, opportunity forward and I look forward to meeting all of you someday in person. Great, thanks so much for sharing Heather. That's really cool. Anybody Hi, else? Um, one one yeah. of the things I wanted to say was don't be worried that you don't know, you know everything about gray whales when you show up for your first shift, because that's when you know you can buddy up with a veteran, hang out at the table with um, some of the folks who are doing the display information, and um, you'll pick it up, you'll pick up information. Plus you'll use that card I showed you with the facts and maybe read some books about gray whales and, and marine mammals. And you know, over time, uh, you'll be amazed at, at how much you'll know. Hey, uh, I have to get my- I interrupted someone I I'm, I'm, I'm... I think Ingrid wanted to introduce herself. Oh yeah, hi, I'm Ingrid and um, I have a great interest in the ocean and protecting marine life. And I would love to become a docent and help people appreciate the whale. Um, this would be my first time volunteering doing something like this. So I'm pretty excited. It sounds like an amazing program. I'm so impressed with everybody's knowledge and enthusiasm. And I very much look forward to becoming like part of the team. And um, I, I'm not a biologist. I'm 
an attorney by profession and I I don't have any particular knowledge of you know biology or whaling or anything like that but I'm excited to learn not a requirement awesome. to volunteer what's in, what's required is enthusiasm and and <laughs> and wanting to participate and wanting to learn and wanting to share information about the whales and the migration and the ocean that we're overseeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ingrid. Mm -hmm. also has his hand raised. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Bill Tucker. I'm uh, new to Sonoma County uh, for about a year and a half. I'm uh, just retired from UC Davis as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Technology Commercialization. So I'm a, an avid biologist. Uh, been tracking a lot of humpbacks in Hawaii and uh, in Monterey Bay and looking forward to getting involved and in looking at and dosing for the gray whales here. So uh, really appreciate the time today and hopefully uh, we'll be able to find some time on the weekends to come out to Bodega Head and, and help out. Cool. Anybody else? No? Okay, well, I'd just like to really second um, what Norma said, and this applies to all our programs. Um, you know, if don't, don't let feeling like you have a lack of knowledge um, stop you from participating. All our programs are um, completely chock full of uh, long-term volunteers who are just an incredible wealth of knowledge. And, um, you know, if you feel like you might not have the knowledge to participate, participating is a great way to gain that knowledge. And um, people are very, very generous with their knowledge. It's a, it's a really beautiful thing. Um, okay, so um, I want to all. So we've gone over all the exciting stuff. I'm sorry, I just have um, <laughs> one not quite so exciting thing to show you, and that is um, I wanted to show you a little bit about scheduling. Um, this is um, the Whale Watch, and I will send you a link in the chat to this. But this is the Whale Watch page on the Stewards website, and. Um, there's a bunch of resources on here for you, um, including the paperwork that we were talking about previously, a volunteer handbook, some other bits and pieces, the info card that Norma was talking about. Um, but you'll see this link down here, Whale Watch Schedule. And uh, you click that link and that will take you to this simple uh, Google Calendar. This Google Calendar is not live yet. Um, it will be made live shortly. Um, and when it goes live, all the, um, all the Whale Watch participants uh, will receive an email letting you know that um, you can now schedule your time. But, um, you know, you will see that um, that the uh, coordinators will already have their names in some of the Saturdays and Sundays that they intend to, to be there. And you can just click and simply add your name and contact details in, um, in any Saturday or Sunday that you wish to participate in. And it will be limited to six spaces. Um, and it's that simple. That is, that's as simple as, as scheduling will be. And um, I will send you the link to that. Um, in the chat in just a moment. Um, but that's really all I have to say about scheduling. Norma, do you wanna add anything about scheduling? No, we just, I'm sure we'll have um, at least six people wanna show up and help us out there. So we look forward to the opportunity to be out on the head again and to talk with people about the migration. Also, if anyone wants to come out, even when they're not scheduled, that's always a great place to go and just see what's, what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody is absolutely free to go there when they're not scheduled. Um, it's just only six people at a time can be wearing the vests and, and counting their hours as volunteers. But of course, I encourage everybody to go up to the head as often as they can because why wouldn't you? It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, is there any Springs eternal that will open up a little bit more as the season goes on, but you know, that's to be determined. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, is there any any other questions? Is there anything? Any questions anybody has? No? Okay. Well, actually, um, yes, Andrew, before I got this invitation that we're closing up here, there was a, one that they, uh, a forum from state parks that was online that was coming from uh -huh. yours. Can you send out that address or somebody, state park coordinator? Sure. Thank you. Um, sure. Are you talking about the, um, the general intake forms? Uh, I guess that, not the paper ones, not the ones we signed, but she was going over a web page. Oh, you're talking about the database for reporting time? Yeah, that's the one. No. Oh, yeah. Um, you can access it from the stewards website, or we could send you a link to... Um, Where's it at on the stewards? I can bring that up right now. Stewardscr.org. There's a volunteer tab at the top oh. of the... Um, and it's the fourth one down volunteer portal. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. So any other questions before we wrap up? I had a quick oh. question. Sorry if you've already said this. When is the anticipated um, start date for volunteering? February 1. Yeah, this program starts in January. Yeah, January 1st. Okay, thank you. It begins from January through the end of May from 10 to 2, with the exception of the weekend of Fisherman's Festival at Westside Park, which is the last weekend of April, would be April 30th and May 1. Right? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Cool. Okay. Well, um, I'm just going to pop my email address. Justin's reminding us, don't forget the auction. Don't forget. <laughs> it's the on auction. the website. <laughs> it's how we raise money to support our programs. One of the ways we raise money to support our programs is we have these wonderful auctions throughout the year. And uh, I just put my email address in the chat if anyone has any questions or needs any help onboarding, needs any help with any of the volunteer forms, has any questions about anything, please just email me or um, you know, give me a call and I'll be happy to help walk you through it. And um, I really hope to see all of you up on the head sometime real soon. So we can all say, there she blows. <laughs> Indeed. Sherry, did you have one last comment to say? Did anybody else? Were you trying to talk, Sherry? Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I must have unmuted accidentally. I was trying to get the dog. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed Hi, it. everybody. Thank you okay. so much for being Thanks here. Thanks so much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you out on the head.